Welcome to Lumi. Today we're going to talk about sample space and events. These are concepts that form the foundation of probability, which is a big theme of this chapter. Now, probability may be the most exciting chapter for some and most confusing for the other. A good place to start for understanding probability is to build a solid base in grasping the fundamentals that we will go over today. Now, the first concept we will talk about here is called the random experiment. And this is the technical term for observing something uncertain. The process of flipping a coin, rolling a die, or drawing a card and such can also be called random experiments, as we do not know the outcome beforehand. In our example, after Joe draws his card, now Donald needs to draw a card from the deck. And we don't know which card he will get. So this itself is our random experiment. For random experiment, its sample space is defined as the set of all possible outcomes for that experiment. So this is the set of all the possible things that can happen in your random experiments. In our example, this would be the 52 individual cards that Donald can draw. Lastly, we define an event as a set of specific outcomes of an experiment. So for all the possible outcomes in the sample space, we define some rule or criteria and single out a subset of the outcomes. For our example, an event could be Donald winning the game. We know Joe drew a seven. So the set of outcomes where Donald draws a number eight or higher correspond to the event of Donald winning. Lastly, for some notations, we use the letter S to represent the entire sample space. And this is sometimes also called the universal set. And now we use letters like A and B to represent events, which as we just discussed, are subsets of the sample space. Now let's move on to talking about the relation between events. In describing these, a tool that you will see in every single probability course or probability textbook is the Venn diagram. So in a Venn diagram, we use an outer large rectangle to represent the entire sample space. And circles within it represents our different events. So the, this circle here correspond to the event A. So the part inside the circle refers to event A happening, and the part outside the circle refers to event A not happening. With this, the first relation we discussed is called the intersection. The intersection of two events is the set of outcomes in the sample space in which both events happen, or in short, A and B happening. The key word here is and. On the diagram, it is a part that's both inside the circle of A and the circle of B. So the little part here, this is the intersection of event A and event B. And notation-wise, we represent this with a little upward hump-shaped symbol. So this is the symbol for intersection. So we have A intersection B written as such. A property related to intersection is called mutually exclusive. Intuitively, this refers to two events that have no possibility of happening together. In other words, their intersection is empty. On the Venn diagram, this refers to two circles, two events, not touching at all. So we do not have any overlap between them. Next, we have the union of two events. And the union of two events is the set of outcomes where at least one of the events happened. We can refer this generally as A or B. On the Venn diagram, it refers to the entire goggle-shaped area here uh, in the section where either inside the circle of A or inside the circle of B or both. And notation-wise, this is represented with a U-shaped symbol. So when we represent the union of A and B, we will write A union B as such. Now, a clear distinction must be made between intersection and union as even though they both refer to some form of combining two events, they have completely different meanings. You can associate intersection with the keyword and, and the union with the keyword or. And also to tell between the symbols, you can view the intersection symbol 
as the N in intersection. And you can view the symbol for union as the U in union. Lastly, we have the complement, which is actually easier to understand. The complement of an event refers to all the outcomes under which this event does not happen. So on the Venn diagram, it simply means the part outside the circle. We denote this as a superscript C, which, as you can probably tell, stands for complement. But some professors and textbooks may also use the notation of a bar or sometimes a prime to denote the complement of an event A. A simple example of complement in our game between Joe and Donald is simply who wins. If we define A as the event that Donald wins the game, then its complement will be all the possible outcomes in which Donald does not win. So the event that either Joe wins or they tie. Some useful properties of the complement are as follows. The union of an event and its complement is the entire sample space. And this is easy to understand. Either A happens or it doesn't. So either A happens or its complement happens. So the union of those two form the entire sample space. And secondly, the intersection of an event and its complement is empty. And this is fairly easy to understand as well. In other words, A and A complement will be mutually exclusive and they cannot happen together. Logic logically speaking, you cannot win and lose at the same time. Today, we're going to use these concepts to talk about what exactly probability is. Simply put, probability is how likely something is to happen. Formally, it is defined as follows. Given an experiment and a sample space S, so remember here that an experiment is a process by which we observe something uncertain, and the sample space is all the possible outcomes for that uncertain thing. So for any event A, we assign to it a number, PA, which we call the probability of the event A, as a measure of the chance that A will occur. And so it is defined as the number of outcomes that satisfy your event A divided by the number of total outcomes in the sample space. So it's basically a ratio of the number of times that A happens out of the, all the possible outcomes in your sample space F. A Venn diagram, as we have introduced before, can really help with our understanding of probability. On a Venn diagram, probability can be simply understood as area. So recall that on the Venn diagram, our sample space is represented by the rectangle on the outside. So this is our sample space. So we can say the probability of the sample space is equal to the area of the outer rectangle, which we know is equal to one. And as for any event inside your sample space, recall that we denote them with a circle. So the probability of event A can be simply understood as the area of the circle on your Venn diagram that correspond to event A. And next, there are two axioms related to probability, and they're both pretty easy to understand. The first axiom states that the probability of any event must be a number between zero and one. In other words, it can not be a negative number or a number greater than one. Um, the second axiom states that the probability of the sample space, which you can understand as the probability of all outcomes together, is equal to one or 100%. And other than that, there are also a few um, properties of probability that may come up in the calculation problems. The first and somewhat trivial property of probability is that the probability of the empty set, so the probability of nothing, is equal to zero. So there's not much to it. So if you understand it as um, on the Venn diagram, uh, the empty set is basically nothing, right? Nothing. So the probability of nothing is equal to zero. Next, we have this really key uh, property about probability that relates the probability of a union of two events to the probability of an intersection of two events. So recall that the union of events A and B refers to the outcomes where either A or B happens. And the intersection of A and B 
refers to the outcomes where both A and B happens. Now to understand why this property holds, we can look to the Venn diagram. So as we have said before, we know the uh, region corresponding to A union B is all the region covered by your circle of A and your circle of B. And we know that this is equal to the circle of A. So we have the area corresponding to the circle of A, that's the probability of A. And then the circle corresponding <coughs> to events B, and the area of that is PB. So what is the relationship between the probability of A or B, or A union B, with the sum of probability A and probability B? We notice that we can obtain this area if we add up the two circles together, but also notice that there will be a region in the middle, this olive-shaped region here, that we counted twice. And this region actually exactly corresponds to A intersect B, because in this little region here, both event A and event B have happened. So we can calculate as such. So the probability of A union B, so all the area inside either of these circles, is equal to the probability of A, which is the area corresponding to circle A, plus the probability of B, which is corresponding to area of circle B, minus the center part in which we counted twice, and that is the probability of A intersect B. And from this, we can also derive another property, which is exact, exactly identical to what we have here. So the probability of A intersect B, we can also write it as PA, plus PB minus probability of A union B. And now let's move on to the properties of two mutually exclusive events. Remember by mutually exclusive, we mean that the event A and event B cannot happen together. And from this definition, we can dir uh, directly obtain our first property, the probability of the intersection of two mutually uh, exclusive events is always equal to zero. And this, combined with the relation between the probability of union and intersection that we have just derived, gives us the second property, the probability of the union of A and B, if A and B are two mutually exclusive events, is simply equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B. So on the Venn diagram, you can see this property in action as well. So if A and B are mutually exclusive, that means on the diagram, they do not touch each other. So if you want the uh, probability of A union B, we will simply add up the area of circle A with the area of circle B. And lastly, the, a special application of this would be an event and its complement. First, we know that two complementary events are mutually exclusive. So A with A's complement can never happen together. So we can use the formula for their union directly. So we know the probability of A union A complement is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of A complement. But we also know that either A happens or A does not. So A union A complement is actually equivalent to your sample space. So basically, this states that if we know an event happens, uh, the probability of that event not happening is equal to 1 minus the probability of A. Today's lesson is about Bayes' rule, which is a type of staple exam questions related to the concept of conditional probability. To understand Bayes' rule, let's first review the concept of conditional probability. If we have two events, A, and B, we say the probability of event A given event B is calculated as the probability of A intersect B divided by the probability of B. And also recall that we can use this formula to derive an expression for the probability of A intersect B. We can write it as the probability of B multiplied by the probability of A given B. And also, we can also write this as probability of A times the probability of B given A. So two ways to write the probability of A intersect B. And we'll be using this in today's discussion on Bayes' rule. And now introducing the Bayes' rule. This is the general formula. Looks pretty daunting, right? 
formula itself looks pretty monstrous, but don't be afraid. It will easily make sense when we go over the intuition. For now, let's start with a quick exercise using properties of conditional probability to see how we got this formula. So we start by writing the definition of probability B given A. So this is given by the probability of B intersect A divided by the probability of A itself. And now we want to do some uh, modification to both the numerator and the denominator, and we want to write it in terms of conditional probability. So the conditional, uh, so the intersection of B and A, this probability, we can write it as the probability of A given B multiplied by the probability of B. And that's for the numerator. As for the denominator, we want to kind of uh, separate the probability of A into two terms. So first, we start with probability of A and B plus the probability of A intersect B complement. Because we know either B happens or B doesn't. So the probability of A is the probability of A and B both happening plus the probability of A happening but B does not. So this is the transformation for the denominator. And next, with the intersections, we also want to write it in terms of conditionals. So we keep the numerator the same probability of A given B times the probability of B. And for our denominator, we have probability of A given B times the probability of B. So this is equivalent to probability of A intersect B. And also for probability of A intersect B complement, we also write this probability of A given B complement multiplied by the probability of B complement. And here, you should be able to see that what we have at this step is identical to the base rule formula. So the purpose of this formula is that it gives you a relationship between the probability of B given A with the probability of A given B. So the relationship between the two inverse of the, uh, the two inverted uh, conditional relationship. Before you jump in and mindlessly use the formula to calculate the answer mathematically, let's actually figure out exactly what it means and how it works. To do so, we will represent the situation with a tree diagram. Pro tip alert, for any Bayes rules problems, or in fact any problems with conditional probability, working your way through a tree diagram is almost always a good idea. So for a tree diagram, we represent the first random event with the first two branches. So starting from our original node, we have two possibilities, whether the person has orange head or they do not have orange head, right? So we have for this branch, the probability of someone having orange head, we know is 0.001. And the probability of someone who do not have orange head, the probability of O complement is equal to 0 0.999. So that's our first random event. And we know from this that for a person with orange head, there are two possibilities. They could get tested positive or they could be negative. And for those without the disease, it could also be that they get tested positive or they get tested negative. So these four correspond to the probability of someone getting tested positive given when we're at the first branch. So given they have orange head. And then the next part is correspond to the probability of getting tested negative given they have orange head. And then the lower two correspond to the probability of getting tested positive when they do not have orange hat, the probability of positive given O complement. And then the last one is the probability of getting tested negative given O complement, given the person do not have the disease. And we can write in the numbers for these. So we know the probability of getting tested positive when you do have the disease is 99%, so 0 0.99. And the probability of getting tested negative when you have the disease is 0 0.01. And the probability of getting a false positive when you do not have the disease is 0 0.02. And the probability of correctly getting a negative is 0 0.98. So we have just written all the information regarding the example onto the tree diagram. 
Now to solve our problem, remember that what we want to find is the probability of someone having orange head given that they tested positive. And by formula, this is equal, equal to the probability of some, someone having the disease and testing positive divided by the probability of someone testing positive. So it's useful to first find the probability of someone getting tested positive. And how do we do that? Well, we know there are two outcomes on the tree diagram that correspond to a positive test result. It could be that someone has the disease and they test positive. So this is one way of getting a positive result. It could also be that someone do not have the disease, but uh, they're given a false positive. So this is the second way. And we can calculate the probability of each of these two events. So we know the probability of someone having the disease and testing positive is the probability of them having the disease, so 0 0.001, multiplied by the conditional probability of testing positive given they have the disease, which is 0 0.99, and we're able to get a number of 0 0.00099 for the outcome that the person both has the disease and is tested positive. And for the other case, we have a 0 0.999 chance of the person not having the disease, and given that there is a 0 0.0 two chance that they will, also get a, uh, they will also get a positive result. So the joint probability here is 0 0.01998, right? So combining these two, we know that the probability of orange head and positive, if we add that to the probability of not orange head and positive, we will get to the probability of just in general, someone getting tested positive. So if we add up the 0 0.99 and the 0 0.01998, we would get to a number of 0 0.02097. So about a 2% chance in general of getting a positive result. And now we can finally go back and answer our original question. So going back to the formula, so the proportion of people who have the disease and is tested positive, we know here, this number here is 0 0.00099 and divided by the total amount of people who test positive, which is 0 0.02097. And if we do the division, we will be able to arrive the answer of 0 0.04721. So notice here that for someone who tests positive of the disease, there is actually only about a 5% chance that you actually have the disease, uh, the disease. So even though the test is actually quite accurate, so for those who do not have the disease, it will correctly identify you as negative 98% of the time. And for those with the disease, it will correctly identify you as having the disease 99% of the time. But we see that with a positive test result, it only means that you have a 5% chance of actually having the, disease, uh, having the disease. This number is much higher than the 0 0.001 for an average person, but it is still not uh, definite that you have the disease. So this is the key takeaway from the base rule. This lesson is the last part of the discussion of conditional probability. The topic is called independence. Again, something we have seen when we discussed two-way tables. Today, we will discuss its formal definition and its related calculation properties. To understand independence, we need to first recall the formula and the idea of conditional probability. We said the probability of A given B, which means the probability of A happening given that event B has already happened, is equal to the probability of A intersect B divided by the probability of B. And we can also write this as the probability of A intersect B equals the probability of A given B multiplied by the probability of B. Now let's talk about independence. Formally, we say two events are independent if and only if this formula here holds. Intuitively, in the most basic form, Independence means that the two events are completely unrelated. 
For example, the event of me having pizza for lunch tomorrow should not have any bearing on whether my favorite football team wins their next match. In this way, having knowledge of one event happening or the fact that it did not happen should not affect our valuation of the probability of the other events. So the probability of A given B should be the same as the probability of A given B complement, which means B did not happen, and equal to the general probability of the event A itself. For example, if we define event A as the current trade war ending, and event B as the outcome of the upcoming presidential election, and say the probability of the trade war ending is in general to be 60% or 0.6. If events A and B are independent, that means the trade war has the same chances of ending regardless of who wins the election. In other words, knowing the outcome of the election does not affect our conception of the likelihood of the trade war ending. So before the election outcome or after either way of the election outcome, we should have the same probability for A. On the other hand, if these events are dependent, which intuitively means that the outcome of the election does affect the outcome of the trade war, then depending on whether B happens or not, we would have different predictions about the probability of A. Now, there are certain probability properties which hold only for independent events. Firstly, if A and B are independent, that means either A or A complement would be independent of either B or B complement. Complement of an event is simply the other side of the coin. If knowing B does not give you any information on A, then knowing the fact that B did not happen shouldn't tell you anything new either. Another property to note in particular is about the probability of an intersection, which we have seen previously can be written as the probability of A intersect B could be equal to probability of A given B multiplied by the probability of B. And if we know that A and B are independent, we also learned today that the probability of A given B, this term here, can just simply be replaced by the probability of A, which means we can arrive at the final result here. For two independent events, the probability of their intersection is simply the product of the probability of each of the events themselves. If this reminded you of the multiplication principle from before, pat yourself on the back. Good job. This is exactly the reasoning behind that. Lastly, somewhat related to the last example we have just seen, independence can also be defined for more than two events. And for that, we have two types. We say three events, A, B, and C, are pairwise independent if for any pair of two events among them, uh, the independent condition as expressed in the intersection form holds. So all these three equations hold if A, B, and C are pairwise independent. The other type is called neutrally independent, which requires the probability of the intersection of all three events together to equal the product of each of the events multiplied together. As a final note, let's make the distinction between two completely different, but still often somehow confused ideas. In the lesson today, we have introduced the idea of independence, referring to the idea of two events being intuitively unrelated. In a previous video, we have talked about two events being mutually exclusive, referring to the idea that two events having no possibility of happening together. If you pause and think for a second on these definitions, you can probably realize that they're different. But still, this is one of the parts that statistics students make the most mistakes. Repeat to yourself, these are not the same. In fact, independence means that the probability of A and B should be equal to the probability of A times the probability of B, where mutually exclusive means the probability of A and B should equal zero. Two events cannot be independent 
and mutually exclusive at the same time. Intuitively, independence means knowing B does not give you any information on the probability of A. But if they're mutually exclusive, knowing that B happened gives you a ton of information on A. If B happened and A, B are mutually exclusive, then we know for sure that the probability of A is then zero. By spending all this time talking about this, I just want to hit home the point that these two concepts are completely separate. So make sure you don't ever confuse them.